persuading others to keep the Iranian Navy at bay and ensure safe passage for its supplies. They were moves that ultimately made the Gulf less safe, however, by prompting the Iranians to mine international waterways. Submersible television cameras searched for deeply laid mines, while helicopters hunted any on the surface. This was a role in which the Royal Navy specialized. Capture of the Iran Adja was offered as final proof that Iran had been mining the Gulf seaways. Rows of mines on her deck as the evidence. After making the maximum publicity, the Americans sank the boat and repatriated its crew. But the presence of modern Western naval power did not prevent Iranian frigates from checking the identities of tankers in the convoys. This is uh, calling you. I'll get it over. Yes, I'm clear. Over ship, clear. This is the British tanker Ice Maria. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, ship. What is your ship's name, please? Uh, ship's name is Ice Maria. Far from deterring the Iranians, American and British presence provoked them into testing Western determination and confrontation increased. Iranian warship, this is U.S. warship 993. Your after gun mount just pointed in my direction. Do not do that again. Over. The Iranians played the same game. U.S. Navy ship, this is Iranian warship. If you hear me, it seems to me that your helicopter is unable to hear me on guard frequency 243. Advise him not to close to me less than five miles. Over. By now, the very tankers the warships went to protect were themselves protecting their escorts by steaming in front to act as mine shields. No bigger a contradiction, perhaps, than America's reaction to the Iraqi Exocet missile attack on the frigate USS Stark, killing 37 crew. The Americans blamed the close proximity of a shadowing Iranian gunboat and, far from retaliating, accepted Iraq's apology and redoubled efforts to prevent Iran intercepting Western oil supplies. Tit-for-tat attacks on oil installations followed. The Sea Island city terminal, 10 miles off the Kuwaiti coastline, was hit by Iranian missiles. Its temporary disabling was retaliation for a United States attack on Iran's Rashidat rig, which was not just an oil installation, but acted as a base for Iranian speedboats. These were crucial weapons in the Iranian armory, used so effectively in their marshland offensives. Tragedy followed their attack on the American cruiser Vincennes. Incoming boat spotted on radar. Almost simultaneously, another apparent attack is identified. Its SAM missile is fired, unknowingly not at a warplane, but a passenger jet. Cat has got it. Oh, it's dead on. 290 civilians died, and with them, Iran's hopes of victory. Its leaders now believing the superpowers would stop at nothing to prevent Iraq losing. Iran, meanwhile, made its most important land gain, the Four Peninsula, taken in 1986 in a major thrust against the old target of Basra. This effectively cut Iraq off completely from the Gulf and the disputed Bubiyan Island area that would lead to its invasion of Kuwait. Offensive Wa al Fajr 8 brought Iranian forces closest to the objective that had eluded them for so long. Three Iraqi armored columns were destroyed as the Iranians made gains they were to retain for nearly a year. They had caught Iraq's static defenses by surprise to occupy land of no military importance but immense political significance. But the biggest prize, Basra, eluded them, just as large Iranian cities had defied Iraqi encirclement years before. Yet Iran itself had failed to learn that lesson, and this was the closest they got.
devastating barrages by rocket and artillery backed by armored assaults eventually enabled Iraq to break the Iranian stranglehold. With Iran eventually war-weary and on the brink of accepting the United Nations Peace Corps, Iraqi forces once again poured across the border in a last-ditch land grab. Although the war had failed to produce a clear victor, Iraq's supreme leader, Saddam Hussein, contrived to convince his people that they had won despite failing in all his war aims. Saddam had made one clear gain, popular unity. On the banks of the war-torn Shat al-Arab waterway, statues of 99 of Saddam's fallen commanders point accusingly at Iran, glossing over the fact that it was Iraq which opened hostilities. Grandiose monuments like Baghdad's Arch of Swords were erected to celebrate Saddam's triumph over the hated Persians, complete with its cascade of helmets from the battlefields. Iraq ended the war with a standing army of awesome size, a million men under arms, five times as many as in 1980. They were armed with the latest rockets, tanks and artillery. But to pay for them, Iraq's economy had been mortgaged to the tune of nearly $100 billion. At the same time, the oil industry, its biggest earner, was devastated. 10 million shells had landed in the Basra oil fields alone, and essential facilities now lay in ruins. Iraq's invasion of Kuwait brought Baghdad several rewards, enlarged oil production and revenue, the cancellation of war debts, and the satisfaction of an ancient territorial claim. Though clearly threatened, the takeover still caught civilians by surprise, and they fled inland as the invaders poured onto Kuwait City's beaches. The vastly outnumbered Kuwaitis offered unexpectedly stiff resistance. But they were seriously outgunned and outnumbered as the Iraqi assault focused on the barracks of Kuwait's elite royal guard, center of resistance beside the ruling emir's palace. That resistance crumbled with the arrival of Iraqi helicopter gunships, but the world reacted with unprecedented solidarity. The United States aircraft carrier Independence spearheaded a huge multinational force gathered to police the Gulf and support the state next thought to be at risk, Saudi Arabia. Black Hawk and Apache helicopters were poured in in numbers not seen since the Vietnam War. Armored divisions, American and British, were shipped to the area backed by troops from the United States and Iraq's rivals for Middle East leadership, Egypt and Syria. Hundreds of thousands of men now prepared for a further Gulf War. <laughs> 